John, how you doing today? Doing well, Travis. Appreciate you having me on. So I guess uh, in 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 it in in total, uh, again a a very busy weekend, not only at Alabama but various programs uh, around the Southeast. And as we've talked about before, looks like a lot of action for in-state kids in this next class, this 2019 cycle, maybe as compared to the 2018 group, when you talk about the power five level anyway. No doubt. Uh, I think, you know, it was in the forties in 2018 in terms of power five kids, 2019. I mean, it's kind of a running joke almost. I mean, the number grows every single day. A kid just actually texted me that he got his first power five offer today. So it's going to be in the 75 range. Are you talking 30 more power five kids? If you divide that into the Alabama Auburn echelon, that's, you know, maybe four or five extra kids in that group. So it's a huge group. There's no doubt that both Alabama and Auburn will have a massive focus in state. They already have a massive focus in state and offers are flying out there because everything's a little bit more accelerated now with that early signing period. Kids are, are beginning to actually schedule early official visits. So if you're interested in a kid and you want to get in the game, it's like you have to offer now. And we saw Alabama jump into that full force. They might have offered 10 or 12 kids on Saturday alone, including several in state in 2019 and even 2020. So um, everything's kind of picking up now. And um, and the state will be a very, very important piece, not only for Alabama and Auburn, but, but for a lot of Southern schools. I was going to ask you about that, John, uh, specifically to Alabama given how much Nick Saban and his staff and the program had on the table going into the, the, the February signing date, is that kind of a, an adjustment or an adaptation that we're already seeing from Saban in terms of maybe rearranging the process a little bit, uh, uh, tweaking the process a little bit to fit more with trying to get this done more so in, in December than February? Yeah, that's, that's the goal. Um, and I think that was partially the goal last year. But I think when you combined it with the staff turnover, playing obviously until the last game um, and a smaller class from the beginning, it was tougher to get to that goal, even though it was pretty clear that, hey, you wanted the bulk, if not all of your class to sign in December. Now with more time, having gone through it once, having a full staff in place that is younger and, and probably less mobile in terms of guys moving on, we would think, at least at this juncture, and the class being a full class, at least with the early projections, combined with how strong this state is, it was more of a tweak last year, and I think this year it'll be a full adjustment, like I said, more so to what they, they would have liked from last cycle's class in terms of adjusting and pushing December more, but I think just there was a lot of circumstances that, that kind of didn't let them fully uh, take advantage of that early signing period. I, I really would be surprised if that is the case uh, with this 2019 cycle. I would imagine, I, I, I would be shocked if, if maybe, you know, anything less than 18, 19, 20 kids signed uh, come December, if it's the same date, December 20th through the 22nd. Wow. Um, talking with John Garcia, 247sports.com, also Yellowhammer. Two four seven. Uh, this this revamp staff. There's no other way to put it. Uh, unlike really anything we've seen under Nick Saban here at Alabama. What's the initial feedback been from the prospects? Uh, I, I'm guessing it's positive, but is, is there a coach or two that you're hearing more about at this point, or is it is it pretty much spread evenly over this uh, uh, again this revamp staff? Yeah, it, the returns are pretty early for most guys, especially, you know, Coach Cool, who's, who's the newest one, the D-line coach. But aside from him, I think Pete Golding and Jeff Banks have taken, not the reins, but they, they've dominated the, the early conversation, at least from prospects that, have, that I've heard from. But the unanimous thought with, with Gaddis and Scott and the rest of the guys is that there's, there's such a, a, an excitement around the coaches like beginning from the coaches typically in covering Alabama, you know, the excitement comes from the kids and there's one or two coaches that's known as the exciting guy, whether it's a Mario Cristobal or a Tosh Lupoy or certainly a Scott Cochran. But now kids are initiating that conversation from the coach's perspective. You know, 
Jeff Banks is so excited to be there. And then, you know, it kind of bounces back to the recruit as opposed to the other way around. Um, so I think that the youth is part of that. And the fact that, again, a lot of these guys aren't necessarily longtime coordinators just waiting on that next step to, to become a head coach. And there's nothing wrong with that. But obviously, Alabama's had a lot of that over the years. So I think you can tell it's a younger group, an aggressive group. Um, like Cordell Flott, Flott is an in-state kid, a, a cornerback from down in Saraland that they offered. And he said, I had never even talked to Alabama until two days before the visit. So this was Thursday. Um, Carl Scott gets in contact with him and says, hey, man, we like your tape. Come up. And the kid comes up, spends the whole day on campus Saturday. And he said, it, it was my first time visiting, but I felt like I'd been there two or three times because of how consistent the coaches were, how complimentary the coaches were, and how, how kind of all over the place they were, for better or worse. And that's just not something we're used to hearing. We're used to hearing about how calculated Alabama is, about you know how, how much of a sell it is from a business perspective and an overall perspective. But now you're getting, a, you're getting that, that fun, exciting, kind of like this is a big deal thing coming from the coaches as opposed to just the kids realizing that because it's Alabama. So I think the, the reaction is very positive, but it, it's also very different. We talk about this upcoming class for 2019, and it seems like we can't do that without mentioning the in-state quarterback crop. Give us an update on this last weekend or so for guys like uh, Talia Tagavailoa, younger brother of Tua at Thompson High School, uh, and also Paul Tyson. Uh, the quarterback target from Hewitt Trustville over there in the Birmingham area as well. Yeah, two schools and, and two kids that you're going to hear a lot about in the next year or so. Um, look, the, the conversation still begins with those guys, whether you're talking the overall class or, or, of course, the quarterback position, especially having not signed a guy there in 2018. And I think there's a reason both guys are uncommitted. It, it doesn't mean Alabama's not the favorite or maybe the overwhelming favorite, but with what you call the revamp staff, there's still a lot to, to kind of get to from these guys' perspective. They're two very different quarterbacks, so the direction of the offense, what they want to do with the quarterback is going to factor in. And then when you combine it with the fact that each guy is, is literally coveted from coast to coast, it's not like it's, people are like, oh, this kid's going to Bama, so they're kind of backing off, which we've seen in the past. This is not the case with these two guys. They've got offers from all over the country, and they've taken visits, and and continue to expect to take visits. I think Tango Bailoa was at Tennessee in the last week or so. Uh, Tyson was down at a camp yesterday in Mobile, but he'll hit the visit ranks. So I think he was expected uh, at Kentucky most recently. So these kids are still going to take their visits. Uh, and I think that combined with the, the new kind of the Dan Enos, the Mike Loxley angle um, that needs to be hammered down is still a bit of a work in progress because obviously – you know, Enos is new to the staff and Loxley is at a new position. So I think that those pitches have to be um, kind of get the I's dotted and the T's crossed, if that makes sense. But but again, um, it does start with those guys and Alabama is the favorite for those guys. I just think it's there's going to be some things that have to be done to, to finish it as opposed to the conventional thought that it's a matter of, of when and not if. As we let you go, John, never too early to talk 2020, right? And I see where an in-state linebacker, Jackson Bratton, uh, has already been offered by this Alabama staff. Tell us a little bit about Bratton, the kind of player he is, and maybe where Alabama stands in his recruitment early on. Yeah, 6'3", 225 or so. I mean, a great-looking kid. If you're on Twitter and you see a photo of him, you're kind of surprised he's, he's such a young guy. He looks like Keith Holcomb right now, you know, and that's, <laughs> that's obviously rare for an underclassman, a kid who's a sophomore. But if you're playing big boy ball up in Muscle Shoals like he is and you're an all-state performer, that's a big deal. That, that kind of put him on radar, a breakout year. Um, but not enough for anyone else to pull the trigger with a scholarship offer. So how about your first offer coming from Alabama? Uh, and that's exactly the case for Jackson Brad. And Alabama's done that in the past. They've been first to offer – a lot of the prospects in state and out on the roster um, that they're not afraid to trust that evaluation. And uh, Bratton has been a consistent visitor to Tuscaloosa, grew up a big Alabama fan, and now he has that offer. So kind of like we said with those quarterbacks, uh, there's no doubt that Alabama is in the best spot right now, but he's just a 2020 prospect. So a long way to go, but it's easy to see why he's so well liked. The tackling machine runs very well sideline to sideline, fills the gap like a traditional inside guy. But in camps and in, in certain instances, 
He shows he can run as well. Again, Keith Holcomb, I think, is the comp physically and also a little bit with his play. I think he, he has an inside-out game, uh, even though he'll probably end up as an inside linebacker at the next level. So I think Alabama would be pretty happy if, if they were able to, to bring in a guy like that early. And, and again, in-state is going to be very important, not only in 2019, but 2020 is looking much closer to, to that group than, than in years past.